Episode 52 is part of Different Perspective series and today's topic is Should we worry about declining birth rates? Geller Bricker and Sarah Harper will discuss the recent population trends, what it means for our planet and what we can do to prevent population collapse. Daryl is the current global CEO of Ipsos Public Affairs, a polling research, marketing and analysis company. Prior to joining Ipsos, Daryl was Director of Public Opinion Research in the Office of the Prime Minister of Canada. He holds a PhD in Political Science from Carleton University and is the co-author of seven books, including Empty Planet, The Shock of Global Population Decline. Sarah is the Clark Professor of Gerontology at the University of Oxford, a Fellow at University of College uh, and Director of the Oxford Institute of Population Aging. She currently directs the Oxford Programme on Fertility, Education and Environment. Her current research on demographic change addresses two broad questions. The impact of falling fertility and increasing life expectancy and the interaction of population change with the environment. Uh, so I just want to start with, um, with clarifying facts for people. Uh, we all agree that the global population is, uh, is currently trending downwards. Um, Sarah, you think that it's a good thing, and Daryl, you think that it, this trend should be reversed. Is that correct? Starting um, with me, go go ahead, Sarah. Uh, well, I was just going to say the global population is not currently trending downwards. The rate of growth is um, stabilizing, we believe, um, but the population will continue to grow probably for the next couple of decades and then may well flatten and then may well fall, but we are likely likely to see between two and three billion extra people on this planet. Um, that, that is the most likely thing, um, but obviously that, I mean, there could be huge variants uh, either way. Mm -hmm. So the stats I have here is that the world population will continue to grow after 2050 at a steadily decreasing rate. So the rate of growth is going downwards. It will yeah. peak at 10.4 billion in 2086 and then start decline to about 10.3 uh, at a growth rate, negative 0.1%. And the global fertility will be 2.2 children per woman by 2050. So around 2050, we will see actually a declining population. Um, in, in the Western world, the US birth rate was 3.6 children per woman in 1960 to now 1.64 which is below replacement of 2.1. And in the EU, it's even less. It's 1.53. The highest is Niger with 6.89, and the lowest is South Korea with 0 0.8. So this, like, the, do you have any interesting stats to add to this? Sarah or me? Bo both of you. What? Uh, go ahead, Sarah. Go? No, no, no I, was ahead. I was just going to say, you know, this all comes down to, you know, how the numbers are calculated and, how you decided to model them out. And I think that there's a, a, a fair amount of controversy on even what I would consider to be the consensus numbers on this, which are the, the UN's numbers. There's a lot of disagreement about how accurate they are, and particularly how accurate the modeling is, and particularly uh, the uh, issues that have to do with some of the assumptions that they make about pop population and the way they do their modeling. It's one of those things, if you go take a look, there's a lot of questions um, uh, about what's going on. What questions uh, do, do you have? Do I think we're going to be adding two or Well, I mean, a lot of, you know, Sarah was just mentioning, you know, we're going to be adding two or three billion more people. I, I don't think that's really a credible um, statement, um, not from Sarah. Sarah's just working with the numbers that are made available. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's accurate as it's presented. Um, so it's no criticism of, of of what she said, but the way that the UN is coming to its analysis that there's going to be 10.2 billion people on the face of the earth by the end of the century is something that I think there's a, a you can ask a fair number of questions about. Uh, I think that you know the UN uh, uh, presents what they call three variants of the uh, of the um, uh, future population growth, um, and there's one that is uh, the one that is the 10.2 or 10.4 billion that, that's most often quoted is what they call the median variant. And that's based on the population kind of peaking mid-century and very slowly starting to decline by the end of it. And it, it it's based on the idea that there's going to be this convergence around a birth rate of about 2.1. So they make uh, an assumption about that, and then they make assumptions about what they call population tempo or population momentum in terms of how certain generations will behave when they get into the period of time in which they're going to be having kids. Uh, then they have what they call the high variant, which is if it's a half a child more, so 0.5 more, 
it's going to be, I think, over 14 billion. And then they have their low variant, and the low variant is something around 6.2 billion people. Wow. Um, I think there's probably some pretty credible arguments that you could make that somewhere between the high variant or the, the medium variant and the low variant is where we're headed. Uh, and the only, uh, you know, uh, piece of, there's several pieces of evidence that you can, that you can cite in order to suggest that maybe that's something worth considering. The first being that the UN put out its last major model in 2017. And they said that the global population was going to be 11.2 billion people. Five years later, so 2022, uh, they put out their next big analysis, and uh, it was down to 10.4 billion people. So almost, actually, 800 million people fewer in just five years. And uh, I expect that what we're going to see is every two years, they're going to continue to reduce uh, the, the estimates. And then when you take a look at actually what's going on in the ground in terms of, uh, in terms of fertility rates, um, uh, you know, every way that we're measuring expected fertility seems to be underperforming in terms of what's actually happening on the ground. I just saw some interesting data that was published in The Economist last week about uh, what's happening in Africa, where they're saying, oh, my God, there's a, you know, a faster accelerating decline in fertility than, than there was before. So this is a, a pretty fast moving target, I would say. And the next thing is none of it seems to be moving in the direction to say that we're going to be in the high variant area. Uh, there's a a lot of questions based on the data that's coming out on almost daily on what's going on with fertility rates when you look at what's happening in individual countries that suggest even the median variant is probably optimistic. And then when you take into account things like, for example, the UN sees fertility in China increasing between now and the end of the century. Well, the Chinese government isn't even saying that. So I don't know why the UN would be saying that. And if you take a look at Indian and China, which are 36% of the global population, uh, if it's not happening there, by the way, India is now below replacement rate in terms of its fertility. They're, they've dropped to 2.0. And in, in India, probably the replacement fertility is higher because their infant mortality is higher. So I, th I think there's a lot of questions about uh, the assumptions that are being made about how we're going to get to that meet moderate or median uh, a variant by the end of the century that suggests we're probably going to be moving closer to the lower variant. And all of that is basically being driven by fertility, uh, because the, to the extent that we have uh, population growth in, in the world these days, a lot more of it every day is being driven by people not dying as fast as they used to, as opposed to more people coming into the population. So I think uh, um, uh, anybody uh, looking at this would say that there's a lot of questions. I'm not saying I have all the answers. Most of what I'm raising here are questions, but uh, it's, it's a more controversial issue today than I think it was previously. Um, and uh, particularly given that the trends are changing in some fairly dramatic directions in a, in a relatively short period of time. Yeah, gosh. And I mean, I think what Daryl says is, is more or less, um, he is identifying the trends. I think there is a huge caveat around Africa. Um, and, you know, Daryl, I did read bits and pieces of your book. Um, and I think the one critique I have and reviewers can have is your view on Africa. Um, it, it is actually true. I mean, there was a, an academic report that came up probably about a month ago, which actually really questioned the UN uh, and said they thought that uh, total fertility rate was actually going to come down more in line with what you're saying. So it is academics are also saying this. But, but let's just look at um, Africa. One of the things you say in your book, which is really interesting, is that we know Africa's total fertility is going to come down because it's come down everywhere else. And it's very, very true that if you look at what happened historically in Europe and then in the Americas, and then you look what happened over the last 30 years uh, in Asia and Latin America, women, you educate women, you improve the health, in particularly the health of babies and children, uh, and you give them access to modern fertility planning, and they choose, they're empowered to have a certain number of children. And that certain number of children typically is one or two, and it varies between one or two. And that's really what we've seen. One of the reasons why fertility has come down um, in nearly all parts of the world is that when we've empowered women, they A, have children much later, they delay having that first birth, um, and they cease much earlier, or they have spacing. So one or two children. That is not happening in Africa. So we did a huge piece of work um, published in an academic journal, very respected academic journal, presented at the Royal Society, it's caused quite a lot of interest among demographers. And what we compared was what we call ideal family size with the total fertility rate. In other words, we know that in 
all countries of the world, with the exception of sub-Saharan African countries, as they went through the fertility transition, women were empowered. Not only did they have fewer children, but they wanted fewer children. And we picked up that in some African countries, this wasn't happening. So we did an analysis of something called the Demographic and Health Surveys, which is a huge survey um, in, I think it's 154 countries, very robust. And even in a country like Africa, I, I, I think the data is probably um, quite robust. And what we did was we compared different countries at different stages of, the, of reducing their fertility with the ideal family size. Now, everywhere else, and we took it sort of historical periods into account, we took GDP and we took, you know, things like ethnicity, religion, uh, language, etc., into account. And everywhere else, we found, uh, as I said, that when you educate women, they not only have one or two children, but they want one or two children. What we find in Africa is that among the highly educated middle class group, uh, they are having one or two children. So they're going through the fertility transition, but they still want three to five children. Um, that we've done a lot of work trying to work out why that might be. Um, my idea is that if you empower women to have the number of children they want, they choose the number of children that is good for them, their families, their communities. In Africa, at the moment, they are saying, well, we want two children to stay at home and two children to go off to be migrants. And we can now choose the number of children we have because our standard of living has gone up. We have modern family planning. We're educated. Now, if that is the case, what we're saying is that we're going to push that decline in the fertility transition back maybe 20, 30 years, two or three decades. So Africa will not come down below replacement I think you, Daryl, probably said 2050. We think 2060, but actually it may well be 2070 or even 2080. And if that is the case, because of demographic momentum, which Daryl talked about, that means every baby girl is a potential mother. We're going to push back the real decline in African fertility. And Daryl's right. I mean, if you look at Asia, yeah, India and China, amazing, huge, huge populations reducing their fertility. But we also have massive populations in Africa. And we predict that the growth in population is going to come out of Africa for the next two to three decades. And that's why we think we're going to probably go not one, two, three billion Africans, but we may hit four or five billion Africans by the end of the century. And that's why we're going to come out between nine, 10 billion, possibly even up to 12. But I think 10 is, 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 seems to work well. Okay, so uh, we measure desired fertility in a couple of different ways. So there's there's uh, ideal fertility, which you just mentioned, which is what's the ideal size of a family, and then there's desired yeah. fertility. So I think uh, on the ideal fertility, what the record has been is that it doesn't actually match up that well. Uh, desired fertility, it tends to match up a little bit well, uh, a, a lot better. So I'd have to look at the data. And by the way, I don't think yeah. we made a prediction about an empty planet about what the population of Africa was going to be. I think we we basically said in Africa it's going to be the one to watch. We totally agree with you yeah. that uh, yeah. that uh, mm -hmm. it's it's the one that we just don't know. Is it going to buck the trend that we've seen in every other yeah. country? Now there's some interesting contradictory evidence in, in Africa. I haven't seen your study. It's something I'm going to have to go take a look at. So. Plus one. It's in plus one. Yeah, so I'll go. I'll take yeah. a look at it because uh, yeah. it's, it's obviously interesting information. But then when you take a look at the data that's coming out of Kenya on uh, what's mm -hmm. happening fertility, uh, we see in places like Nairobi it's down to two. So yep. it's like, so it's like, okay, which Africa are we going to get? <laughs> and well, and, no, you see, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you see, so we looked at that, and one of the things yeah. is that these women are saying, "I've got two kids now, but hang on, I really want to have another two. And at the moment, you know, there's a little bit of instability, there's crime, I'm a little bit of job insecurity, I'm a little bit worried. Um, but I have not finished by any means. Uh, I'm going to have maybe two or three children in 10 years time if, you know, things pan out. And we did not see that in other countries when the fertility transition came down. So, so, so that's our whole argument is, is that although the, they may be going into the fertility transition, but if you look at the data, they're going in with a, a preconception that they have not completed their fertility. They may want to have two or three other children. And that was not the case that we found. Um, and you, you need to read the paper, but, but but we did a big analysis of all the countries that are in the demographic and health surveys. But I mean, I mean, maybe, you know, we should maybe start looking at some of the dynamics because I think maybe that can help us sort of tease that yeah. out. And then also the implications. 
but, but I think you would agree with me that it is the wild card. So yeah, and, and it would be it would be bucking yeah, yeah, a trend absolutely. that takes place and yeah. has taken place in absolutely. every other region. So absolutely. what we're saying here is that Africa is the exception. And I guess mm -hmm. my my um, my uh, assumption, or I guess my the way I would look at it is, uh, yes, there's interesting data that you've developed in in uh, in, in, in uh, your study of Africa at, at Oxford. Yeah. But let's see what happens in the real world. And the yeah, question yeah. is, and the question is, we we just don't know. My expectation would be that Africa, maybe slower, maybe faster, or whatever, is going to follow the same trend that we've seen everywhere else. But it could be the exception yeah. that proves the rule. I yeah. Mean, no, no. I mean, know. I I think I think it will follow the same trend, but I think it's going to follow it slower, and that's why we're going to get that extra two billion that are you know out there. But still, yeah. yeah so that's that's one of those ones that we can debate. Uh, yeah. The interesting yeah. thing is that the, U the UN isn't debating it. It's assuming that it's going to happen. And I, yeah. and I just but, don't know. But, 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 but it's been very, see, and also read this other report that came up, that, because they very heavily criticised that as well. So, yeah. yeah. It, what about causes or implications? What, what, what do you want to... Oh, me on causes or implications? Uh, well, I think, you know, why Lucy, this is happening. What, 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 oh, yeah, what, Lucy, go ahead. <laughs> Lucy, what, well, I, I, I wanted to ask, so Sarah, you, you claim that declining birth rates are actual and natural progression of human civilization. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to kind of understand where that is coming from. Obviously, we've had population declines and growths over you know the past 5,000 years due to yeah. pandemics, wars, all these things. But women kept having babies. So why, why is it a natural progression of human civilization to decline? You know, decline yeah. birth rates. I mean, I think I think there's enough sort of robust evidence which started in Europe about 250 years ago. We're talking about the demographic transition, really, and the fertility transition. That basically, when you improve, first of all, the health uh, of a, um, a community, um, and then you know you uh, educate and empower women, and you um, enable them uh, to have. I mean, a lot of women know about um, modern uh, family planning methods, but you enable them to have it. Uh, then they will start to control their, their um, fertility. Now, there were obviously different dynamics happening in Europe because women were not really empowered until the 20th century, but we still saw that when we had improved health, babies didn't die, children didn't die, women started to reduce uh, their childbearing. And we've seen the same kind of trend play out in slightly different contexts uh, in the 20th century uh, in the global south, basically. Um, and so, the, I mean, the, the simple argument of the, the sort of way the trend progresses is that if you uh, educate women in particular, keep them in schools, you keep them out of the marriage market. I mean, you quoted something like 6.9 for Nigeria. It's between four and nine. If you look at rural areas in Nigeria, you still have two thirds of the girls leaving school and getting married, often to their father's friends, probably in, in, in the most, um, you know, sort of... <sighs> generous way because they see that an elderly man will look after the very young girl but by 13 they're pregnant and they may have 10 children by the time they're 20. If you can keep those women those young girls in school you keep them out of the marriage market you give them the skills and the confidence to be able to become more economically dependent and you basically empower them and and they then start to take control uh, of their own fertility. The really interesting thing is that we then move on to a, a, a different uh, phase of the demographic transition, which means we've, we've come down to roughly two, three children. What then happens is particularly interesting because then you get these extreme falls in fertility. And that's what we see particularly in Eastern and Southern Europe. We see it in Southeast Asia, you know, Hong Kong, Korea, Singapore, um, Japan, obviously China, though China was a little different, though China actually, its, it's total fertility decline followed very, very closely to that of both East and Southeast Asia. It's just that they had a little bit of a sort of political emphasis um, to, to make that happen. The other really interesting question is why do women then decide not to have children or only to have one child? Um, and this delaying of having children, and that's the sort of modern play out. And, and that's where the fear comes from, that um, in many high income countries, women simply, they're in their mid thirties, they still haven't had their first child. And a, a growing number of them will choose to be child free and then you get these very dramatic falls. You, you can cope with a slow fertility transition, but, but it's when you are, you know, really reducing your population quite dramatically that I think the tensions in society uh, emerge. So 
we have to look at it, as I say, in, in these two phases, basic health, education, family planning, which kickstarts the family transition, or the fertility transition. And then what is happening in these very low fertility, high income countries, which is where there is particular concern. You mentioned so, China. Uh, Sorry, okay, just, just a statistic. So China has a three child yeah. policy since 2021. But yeah. their f- fertility rates are still extremely low, 1.16 yeah. and declining. So, so, it's, so like the policy is not working. Yeah. So, so what happens there is, is, is that you have a one child norm. So basically, in a sort of modern society, most societies have what we call a two child norm. And that goes in with this desired family size idea or ideal uh, fertility, which is that, you know, most women want two children, boy and girl, probably in that order. Big generalization, but that's that's sort of what the data uh, tells us. But when you cut down to a one child norm, it's very, very difficult to raise that up. And we're also seeing it in countries which didn't have a draconian uh, population. So in other words, everybody you know is a one child, your whole society is geared up to a one child, you're a one child, you know, um, all your friends are one children, why would you want to have more than one child? And I think that's what China has done. Because remember, this policy, you know, 79 to 81 was when it really kicked in. So we've had, you know, over 40 years uh, of this, so we're in our potentially in a third generation almost of one child. I mean, we definitely are in, are in a sort of second uh, generation. What what the data seems to be saying is that yes, there is some increase in some people having second children. We're seeing it particularly among women in their late thirties, so women who were only able to have one child, uh, which they had in their twenties, and now suddenly they can have that second child, and so they're choosing to have the second child. But it's almost like two one children. Um, and so the evidence at the moment is that this policy is not particularly successful, particularly among the urban middle classes. And of course, that is the group that China would really like to grow. Um, and, you know, I, I remember, you know, doing some work in Korea and there were all these women. And, and I, I mean, average age of first child, I think, in Europe is now 30. And I think in Korea, it's probably 31 or 32 and um, we interviewed some of these young girls, and it, a lot of that was the structure of the Asian society. It's very, very difficult to be a mother and still be out there in the workforce independently. So what we do, we now work with countries to say, how can we encourage women to have children and to have more than one child? And not that we want them to have two, three, four or five necessarily, but that we you know, want them to be able to have the number of children that they would like to have. And obviously to have one or two children, you know, seems something that should be supported, not encouraged, but supported. And so now I think lots of countries are looking at things like childcare, positive parenting, just trying to enable, allow women to feel confident to have that first child and possibly a second child. Well said. Daryl? Yeah, I think that that's what we want it to be, but it's not really what it is. Uh, um, I think that we want it to be an economic explanation. We want it to be an equity explanation, but really it's a multivariate ex- explanation in which culture is a big part of it. And uh, there's a lot of people, I mean, Pew did a study uh, in which it looked at just the United States, and I understand it's just the United States, uh, about what the major reasons are for people who don't have kids for not having kids. And economy sort of third or fourth on the list. The, the ones that are really at the top of the list are, Number one, an inability to have kids. Uh, And this speaks exactly to what Sarah is talking about, which is when people wait, it makes it it harder. Um, And then the second thing is they just don't want them. Uh, They've decided that, you know, maybe a cat and uh, two vacations instead of one vacation a year is probably a good way of uh, of living. And they've decided that, uh, you know, it's not a great thing. I mean, there's some people who wrap this up in virtue and say, you know, I'm not going to have kids because, uh, you know, it's to the benefit of the planet. But what I like to remind people is that, you know, if everybody makes that decision in a hundred years, there won't be any human beings. We're actually quite a fragile species. So somebody has to have kids or we disappear. So what, what we're dealing with right now in many countries, particularly in the Western world, is people have decided that they want to live childless. Uh, I don't know if you offered them enough money to make it possible whether or not they would actually have kids. A segment of that population would. Uh, if you told them that their career wouldn't be interrupted, a segment of that population would. But it's certainly not 100% of the explanation. And I mean, that's what Empty Planet really showed was that people kind of get to this situation for all sorts of different cultural reasons. But 
some of it related to the economy of, of, of raising children, some of it related to the, the hardships, particularly, well, especially uh, almost exclusively to women in terms of what it does to their, their career and, and other things. But even in places like, you know, the Nordic countries where they've dealt with this in about as aggressive way as anybody could deal with it, they still haven't been able to move fertility above back up to above replacement rate. Now, granted, they're doing better than many of their peer countries in, in, in Europe, but uh, they're not you know, storming through with birth rates of 2.5, 2.6 or anything like that. They're all below, um, all below fertility. So I think that, you know, when we talk about this issue, it's, it's, it's more complicated sometimes than we want. I mean, there, for example, in my country, I live in Canada, I mean, Quebec, uh, went all in on providing the cheapest daycare that of anybody in the uh, in, in the in the country, and it's had a marginal effect on their fertility rate. Um, what what's most correlated to whether or not people have kids, first of all, is whether or not they get married. And we're pushing that back uh, because even even if people decide uh, that they want to have children on their own, it's still a very small segment of the population that does it. So they usually want to raise it in some sort of a uh, some sort of a paired type of relationship. Um, and people are having a harder and harder time even doing that. If you look at age of first marriage, and I know Sarah, I think Sarah just talked about this, uh, age of first marriage. Um, you know, it's, it's going back in many countries. There are some countries where that's not true. A place like Brazil, for example, women still get married pretty early. They still have their, their, their first kid fairly early, but then they have one of the highest sterilization rates in the world where they only have to. So their, their birth rate's down around 1.6 right now or 1.8 in, in, in Brazil. Uh, but for di very different cultural reasons than, say, for example, happens in the UK. So I, I actually think that this is a really multifaceted, difficult problem. I think demographers like like Sarah and the people who are working with her are doing, you know, uh, wonderful work and bringing out the facts about what's going on here. But I think that what we do is we tend to want to go to that place to say that it's an economic issue or it's a, it's a cultural issue in terms of the way that we raise children. But you do see these things where there's this infertility problem that we're dealing with in many countries. And then the other part is just this position, which is, I just don't want to have kids. Yeah. And that's the number one issue. So how do you make it possible for people to say in their lives that they see this as a, as a positive part of their lives? We don't create childbearing experiences or our family building experiences that seem to be as positive anymore as is, is, is what we used to. And by the way, I'm not a traditionalist on this. I'm not, uh, you know, citing religion or because a lot of people do cite religion as being part of the mix here. I'm not a, a lot of people criticize the way that we've gone into the situation. I'm not being critical of it. I just think it's a, it's a real phenomena that people are making this decision. They're making it for some really logical reasons in their lives. And I think an increasing number of people are doing that, which will continue to put pressure on fertility rates. And we end up in a situation like we're in Italy or we're in Spain or we're in Portugal or yes. we're in Eastern, Eastern Europe, Greece, a great example. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so I think it's these multiple things. I think part of the equation definitely is if we ran this as a multiple regression equation with a really high beta score would be people who uh, uh, are saying, I can't afford it. Uh, it's too much trouble in my career. Uh, if there was some support for me, financial support in particular, childcare support or other types of supports, I would be likely to do that. And I think we need to target that because everybody who wants to have kids, we should make it as easy as possible for them to do it. I just don't think it's a, it's going to have as much of an effect as we think. I think we're really battling against a lot of cultural forces uh, different in different countries that are really mitigating against the ability uh, for people to have positive views of, of being parents. And so I, I think it's a pretty complex problem. Uh, I think it's, 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 as I said before, more sociological and cultural than it is necessarily a rational decision because of the economics. And I, I'm afraid when we go down the economics path that too many people see it as this is going to fix the problem. And and if you want to see it as a problem, some people don't see it as a problem, uh, but uh, that this is going to reverse the trend. And, and I don't necessarily think there's evidence, strong evidence that it's going to change things back to, uh, you know, above replacement rate in many, yeah. in many countries. I mean, Daryl, I just, I completely agree with you. You know, it, it's. And, and I think we're in violent agreement on a lot of stuff, sir. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. Yes. So, so I, um, I actually trained as an anthropologist and then went into sort of 
demography. And, and so we always use this mixed methods thing where we actually do a lot of sort of ethnographic work with people. And then we look at the data. And, and I think you're absolutely right there. Are, and I think a lot of demographers now are building much more sort of sociological, cultural variables that that we I mean, there is some argument that we now have a generation that have lost the obligation to reproduce and that we many yeah. societies had, had very strong moral codes. Some of them were religious. Some of them were sort of state sponsored. Some of them were familial. But you sort of had an obligation to reproduce. And I think that has gone. You know, we're in a much more individualistic society. And I think people are saying, um, no, you know, I mean, I'm very happy with you know my life as it is. And I don't it isn't that I don't feel a need to have a child. I don't feel a, the obligation <laughs> to actually continue and, you know, um, to have uh, children. I, I mean, I thought your comment about marriage was very interesting. Um, I know the data for Europe much better, but some very interesting facts around uh, sort of uh, people having their first child out of wedlock. So in nearly every country in uh, Europe, we now have a huge number of children. Their first child is born out of wedlock. But their second child is typically born in wedlock. And that's often the woman that, you know, they have a child, they're cohabiting, and then they say, actually, I need a little bit more security. And so they get married, and they typically don't always marry the father of their first child, but they do get married. And there was some very interesting research which compared. Um, so, so here we are looking at societies where you're having less than two children, so you are well below replacement. And how can we raise it from 1.3, 1.4? Higher. And so we, we looked at um, data which was looking at what was happening in the Mediterranean countries. So, you know, things like Greece, well, Greece and, you know, uh, Spain and um, Italy, for example. And we compared that with what was happening in the Scandinavian countries. And uh, very high incidences of cohabiting well into your 30s. But in the Scandinavian countries, perfectly acceptable to have a child out of wedlock much more difficult to have a child out of wedlock in Southern Europe. And part of that reason seems to be religious in so much as it isn't, I'm not saying that the young people today are very strong Catholics, but their parents, i.e. their grandparents still are. And so in a way, in a society like Scandinavia, where it's culturally very different, and they have good state childcare, comparing with those people in, uh, who are facing this decision in Southern Europe, which is a much more traditional, and they're totally reliant on many cases for the grandmother to help them bring up the child if they want to go back to work because the state childcare is not available. They are delaying, delaying, delaying because they don't necessarily want to go into that kind of a marital relationship, but they know they can't have a child until they do, otherwise they won't get any childcare. So, I mean, I think, you know, we, we can really get down to sort of nitty gritty, just as you're saying, Daryl, of all sorts of cultural expectations. There is a growing group um, who are what we call child, not child less, but child free. And that brings us on to the environment. Um, and one thing we have to bear in mind is it's actually very good for high income countries to reduce their uh, childbearing because we know one of the impacts of population on the planet is consumption. And we're a very high consuming uh, society when you look at high income countries, particularly the US, less so uh, Canada and less so Europe. But still, compared with the rest of the world, we consume huge amounts of the Earth's resources. And so whenever I'm sort of, you know, confronted with a woman who says, look, because of the environment and the impact of population on environment, I don't want to have a child. I say, if you want to have a child, you should have a child, but make it a low consuming child, be a low consuming family. But, but I think that I think that is growing um, quite a lot, actually, that that awareness uh, of the impact of that extra child on the environment. Yeah, I remember the first review that was written of Empty Planet was by Population Matters. And they basically oh. said, yeah, we said, uh, <laughs> we haven't read the book, but we already dislike it. <laughs> no, so I know that <laughs> so I know that there's a there's a whole group of people the minute that you raise anything like saying oh empty planet they, get, they yeah. kind of go a little crazy and i know they're a little more sophisticated than that but you know they're uh, the, the 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 argument about the environment and, and and population i think is really really important because i don't know that we co do a lot of correlational analysis between the size of the population and what's actually happening with global warming particularly if we if we have a pattern in which we actually see the denominator in the equation going down 
which is yes. an urbanizing, which we also know is better for the environment, and aging, which also leads to less consumption. I, you know, I think the more apocalyptic versions of what's going to happen with, with the climate going forward don't take into, in, into account the fact that the, the, the denominator in the equation is actually changing in quite meaningful ways. So I'm a little more optimistic about our future to manage these things. But I would say um, that these things take place in two stages. So the declining fertility um, ends up having an impact on, um, on the size of a population ultimately. But the first part of this is actually not a great thing and is going to be very difficult to manage and nobody really has a solution for it. And not enough people are talking about it. And it's, it's the changing structure of the population. I call it flipping the pyramid in which you know, we don't have any kids and we have tons and tons and tons of old people. And, uh, you know, everything from uh, um, the, the fact that they're sitting on all the a country's wealth and, and what you're asking, uh, well, we just saw what was happened in France, or so we're even just trying to have a discussion about retirement. So managing this bulk of people that's going to be moving through our population over the space of the next particularly 30 years, I mean, 2030, as I like to remind people when we talk about this, uh, you know, everybody who was part of the baby boom, uh, which is basically a Western phenomenon, but everybody who is part of the baby boom is going to be 65 years of age or older. And by the 2040s and 50s, they're all going to be leading this mortal coil. And it would be fine if the structure of the population following them looked like the population of the 1950s, but it's not going to. Everything is getting older. Everything's getting older. And this older population is less capable of reproducing itself. So it's getting itself into this situation where if we don't want to have kids, if we don't want to replenish the population, it's going to be this gradual furthering away. And the uh, bulk of the people that we're going to be dealing with over this next period of time is going to be an incredibly expensive part of the population. Uh, you know, we've got pension plans that aren't funded to do this. We've got healthcare systems that aren't prepared to take care of this level of, you know, particularly things like dementia and caring for people who are going to be in that situation. So if there's a, a you know, a message out of the work that I do, it's not to say, uh, you know, it's terrible to have a lot of kids, but understand the consequences of what we're doing and start getting ready for what we're going to have to prepare for. And I've had, you know, several professors, uh, you know, come to me and say, well, you know, we've got this under control. We can manage this. I said, look, we went from 2.5 billion people in 1950 to 8 billion people today. We're probably not going to get to 9 billion, but we're, you know, somewhere between 8 and 9 billion. It's all happened in the space of less than a century. And then it's going to start coming down. And just as tumultuous as it was on the way up, it's going to be like falling down a mountain in the dark on the way down. We don't know how precipitous the decline is going to be. And we need to get ready to shed some light on some of the issues that we're going to be dealing with on the other side of the mountain, because it's on the way. I mean, I, I disagree with the UN's analysis. I think a lot of demographers, I'm not pretending I'm a demographer, by the way, a lot of people who understand statistics disagree with the, what the UN has come up with. There's a lot of contradictory evidence around things like fertility rates and what's going to happen to the future population. But um, even the UN's projections on what the population are, even if it's slower and the peak is higher, still see a decline in what's going to be coming forward. And particularly in the Western world, we're really going to have to get ready for it because we're just not. We're not even talking about it. Can, can I um, give you three books? Aging Societies, Myths, Challenges and Opportunities, Harper 2006. Aging Societies, Risk and Resilience, Harper forthcoming. And How Population Change Will Transform Our World, uh, 2016 and 2019 paperback. Yeah, and I think, I've, I think I've, read, I've read that one. <laughs> Good, uh, because uh, that's because because that's what we look at. We look at, and I'm so glad. Uh, you're I'm one hundred percent. I'm one hundred percent in Age agreement with you. Structural change. That, that where do you that think I? What, where do you what? think I get these ideas? I get them from <laughs> people like you. So it's not it's not an original <laughs> thought. I mean, and you know, so, I, no, I, and, no, but, but I'm really glad that you brought it up because uh, I mean, to me, a structural change is the biggie for the 21st century. Yeah. Um, and the sleeping and, and, issue. The sleeping issue. Yeah. And, and what is really interesting is that if you look at how many governments are tackling this, they're tackling it by trying to raise the childbearing rate. And that is crazy. It's crazy because... Not going to um, work. Yeah. A, it's not going to work. I completely agree. B, it, put pressure, it puts pressure on women to do something they don't necessarily want to do. C, if you are going to have... And basically, what we're looking at is what we call dependency rates or dependency yeah. ratios. So in other words, you take, you know, 100 workers and how many dependents have they got to support? And one of the problems with China was it had so many young dependents. 
Uh, it brought that down and then its population started aging. If it raises its childbearing, its total dependency ratio, that's young and old combined, is going to be massive. And every baby that's born today is going to have 20 years before it becomes a worker. So we've got 20 years waiting. So this is not the solution. The solution is to say the 21st century is going to be a bit bumpy from a population point of view, exactly, Daryl, as you've said, uh, because we are going to go from population pyramid to a bars into a skyscraper. And probably by the end of the century, uh, from an structural change point of view, we will have most uh, you know, uh, decades of life taking up roughly a floor of a skyscraper. And we are going to, I hope, see the majority, this is the dream, the majority of the population on this planet having the opportunity to live 100 healthy years. Um, but to get there is going to be bumpy. But instead of fighting it, we need to have debates like this. Thank you so much, Lucy. Uh, and we need you know, policies put in place to ameliorate it. One of the things I think you have talked about and, and I also talk about is we, shouldn't, we should not shy away from the migration issue because the way that high income countries have kept themselves young is by basically exporting economic capital to the global south and importing uh, human capital. And, and demographically, that is what migration is. At the global level, it balances out the aging with those other countries that are gonna have a massive sort of youth bulge in the middle of them, and that's gonna cause all sorts of problems. Um, and we should allow that naturally to happen as the 21st century progresses, and then we will have a much more balanced population. Yeah, no, I, it's, well, again, in violent agreement. Um, <laughs> nothing I disagree with there. <laughs> okay. I, I just, uh, it just, it does, does befuddle me, you know, every time I walk in front of a business audience or a government audience that uh, we talk like we're talking right now and jaws are hitting the table because people yes. just have not yeah. thought yeah. about this. I'm, 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 I mean, it has got better. And, and like you, I mean, I've spent the last 20 years flying around the world giving talks. And I have to say the fact that people keep inviting me back to talk on this subject is because I think I think the business community has woken up. Governments have definitely woken up. Um, I think France is a bit of an outlier. Uh, I think the French situation is slightly crazy. Um, I, I, we, we, we did some modeling, which I think... The average age, the average time in population has gone from something like 12 years. The average age, sorry, the average length of time spent in retirement in France has gone from, I think, something like 12 years in 1970 to 27 years now. Yeah. And that's yeah. because they withdrew earlier and lived longer. Um, and, and, you know, we do really need to, to say, I mean, in, in the UK and, and in many parts of Europe, we say stay in education till you're 25 because we're really pushing that boundary. That's good. Um, you know, leave the labour market in your mid fifties and live till you're a hundred. That's twenty five years. You know, somebody's got to pay for it. Pay for it. Ridiculous, ridiculous. Yeah. So, um, I, I, I think France is a real outlier, and I'm just really surprised that 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 argument's been going on for twenty years in the population, and they still haven't quite understood why it is that maybe they need to be economically contributory in some way for slightly longer. Yeah, you know, what I say to people when I talk to them about this is there's a number of solutions that countries are considering. Some of them are the ones that we've already talked about, which are the putting pressure on fertility. Uh, it hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. um, you could do the Japanese thing, which is to say we're all in on service robots. Yeah. Uh, but robots don't buy anything. So I don't know how you run a, an economy based on that. Okay. They yeah. can produce things, but they, they don't consume anything. Uh, and then other countries have bought into the idea that maybe immigration might work for them. So Canada, where I'm sitting today in Toronto, uh, has bought in big time to the idea of immigration. Um, but the uh, as, I, as I caution people, it's a short to medium term solution to whatever the problem is going to be, because the places that we're relying on from immigrants mainly from uh, from the Asia Pacific region are also yeah. going through the same type of transition Absolutely. that we're going through, yeah. except later. And the fertility rate in Canada is lower than it is in the United States. Um, you know, and it's funny people in the uh, um, in uh, U.S. I was in San Diego on the weekend and talking to an audience about this, and and uh, it was we we're talking about Mexico. I said, "Do you realize that the Mexican birth rate is actually not that different than the U.S. birth rate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like 1.6 to 1.8 in comparison. It's like they're going to run out of people too because immigration is a young person's game." It's a young person's game. And the global population is aging more rapidly than anybody is really thinking about because fertility rates are not as high as 
people were projecting that they're going to be. And, you know, take COVID out. We're actually doing a pretty good job at getting people to, to, mm-hmm. to live for longer periods of time, which is why most of the world's population growth today is a product of people not dying as fast as they used to, as opposed to more people coming into the population. So the problem with that, of course, is uh, 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 an immigrant population, is, as I said before, is a young population. And if we have fairly rapid aging in places like Asia Pacific, where also people are now moving into middle-class status, the incentive for them to go and work in another place is not going to be as good. So what I tell everybody, sir, and you, I think would agree with me on that is focus on Africa, (laughs) focus on Africa. If you're thinking about uh, places that you should have good immigration agreements with the only place in the world that has population. And I know they used to call it surplus population. I don't think that's a particularly nice way of putting it, but but um, yeah. but the only place that actually has younger people who are capable of immigrating is going to be there. I mean, India is over the next 30 years is going to start having a lot of pressure mm-hmm. in terms of the people that are going to be leaving. Uh, the Middle East is the, the, everybody thinks, you know, the Middle East has huge birth rates. No, they don't. <laughs> They're, they're similar to Latin America and Europe and the yeah, rest, yeah, of, the yeah. place, the rest yeah. of the world. So where are these immigrants going to come from? And the other thing mm-hmm. I always remind people is that, you know, the people think that there's a, a huge wave of immigrants in, in the world. There isn't. There's only 4% of the global population lives in a country in which it wasn't being born. It's actually a small group of people. They tend to move to the country that's next to them or the region that's next to them. They tend not to fly over oceans and go to those kinds of places. Some of them do. And it creates some political circumstances in places like, for example, where you're you're living in the UK right now. And certainly we're seeing in our next door neighbors in the United mm-hmm. States, and not exclusively, but um, uh, it's uh, it's it, it's it's a it's it's also an issue along with fertility that I don't think a lot of people really understand that well mm-hmm. uh, is is the flows of population through immigration. I mean, the the other way to tackle it, of course, is is to stop having these very fixed numbers. In other words, anyone over 60 or 65 can't contribute to the economy because yeah, we know, so. you know, I mean, 80 year old people today are like, you know, their parents were at 60. I mean, we have in high income countries, we dramatically increased healthy life expectancy. Uh, it is flattening a bit. Um, and even if you take COVID out of the equation, as, as you say, you know, that there are some issues, but on the whole, if, if you can have, policies which have good health, good education across the life course, uh, respect for older adults, good HR and good ergonomic policies. There is no reason in a modern economy why people shouldn't work even an extra five years. And all you have to do is, is, you know, stop people retiring at 60 and keep them in the workforce to 65 or 65 to 70. And you dramatically alter the um, dependency ratios, which is really what people are worried about. So if, if we keep people fit and healthy, they can contribute not only in paid uh, uh, employment, they also contribute through caring. You know, huge numbers um, of older adults are caring for their parents uh, and even grandparents sometimes. Uh, and we also have them producing childcare for grandchildren, which means that that generation can go out to work. They're doing volunteering. Um, so, that, you know, there's this big, big um, contribution to many high income co- um, economies uh, from older people that simply isn't counted. So the health across the life course, education across the life course, so that we don't sort of have this cliff that when you have your population hit 60 or 65, we've all got to panic. Because in theory, we can, that's how we can smooth the curve as well. Yeah, it's, uh, so I had four things that I say to people that they, and the fourth one was rethink retirement, um, because yes. I agree 100%. Mm-hmm. Uh, the single most expensive, stupidest thing that the Trudeau government did when it came into power in Canada, after the Harper government fought hard to move the retirement age from 65 to 67, was to move yeah. it back. It was just yeah. insane. Crazy. Yeah. Insane. So would you have a policy where different occupations would have different retirement age? Let's say if you're a builder, right, and you do lots of manual work, it would be hard for you to work until 70 years old versus if you're an admin worker. So that is really, really interesting because so we about 15 years ago suggested that to the UK government and they weren't interested. We have just had a new review of our state pension age and we obviously contributed to it and we put that forward again. And they have just come out to say that how we put it was when you go into economic activity. So if you um, are in a, a low education, low income, 
a job probably more likely to be manual or maybe a, a, a sort of a certain type of service, you may well start working at 16 to 18 and you could be completely exhausted by the time you hit 60. Uh, however, if you train to be a, a doctor or a professional, because of your training, you probably won't even go into economic employment till your mid-20s, and you probably can easily carry on until you're 70. Um, and that we should look at basically, I mean, we have a national insurance contribution, but many countries have some form of contribution. And so, so many years of contribution. And so, and Lucy, it's exactly your point. The builder who probably starts much younger would be able to retire earlier. The professional person who has all that education they gain from having education would be able to retire later. So we need to really rethink the whole way and, and get, you know, state pension age, retirement, chronological age. We need to separate it. Um, yeah, I, I was going to say that uh, I really like what Sarah is saying. I think that we're going to have to have a lot of conversations like this going forward. And people think that, oh, you know, we'll think about this in 20 years. No, we have to think about it now. Uh, because, yeah. as I said before, 2030 is the year that the entire baby boom, probably mm -hmm. in most countries, would qualify for pensions. Uh, but, uh, you know, even the, the there, there's one conversation to have. But the other conversation is there's a lot of people who want to work. Between yeah. after the age of 65 that are actively discouraged from doing so. It's it's the last ism that exists in the workplace. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is ageism. Society. Is ageism. Ageism in society. It's amazing. Yeah, and, and, you know, we do things like, you know, create open office concepts in office buildings. We'll, we'll see whether people go back to office buildings. Maybe this will help with, with retirement mm -hmm. that are set up for people who have no issues with ambient noise. And we know yes. that older people have a harder time with ambient noise or, you know, uh, they're forced to sit in long rows of desks and that kind of thing. Well, they may have to be more mobile. That's the, the ergonomic mm -hmm. issue that Sarah raised. It. But we, we're not thinking about that now. We're thinking about spark rooms and, you know, so all sorts of other things that are built for this uh, Generation Z generation that is, by the way, not as big as we think it is <laughs> and, not, and, and not necessarily as economically powerful as we think it is either. Uh, when you take a look at the older population uh, that exists, particularly in the Western world today, it's an asset to be to be uh, to be uh, utilized as opposed to just a burden to, to have to live with and deal with. And if we set things up where we turn them into an asset as instead of being a burden, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities here, starting with things like just making it possible for people who want to work longer uh, uh, without getting the side eye from people in the office or people feeling yes. like, you know, they're blocking a place for somebody to move up the, uh, the the corporate ladder, but giving them an opportunity to work longer because we actually need them to work longer. They're also in the stage of their career where their earnings are probably among the highest and they're making larger contributions to the to the pension system as well. But we need a lot more flexibility about how we, we think about these things. Uh, and, but I can tell you, I don't know anybody, maybe some academics are thinking about it, but in kind of mainstream life, I don't see a lot of talk about it. I see a lot of talk about other types of inclusivity, but not on the issue of age. To the no, extent. I mean, so well, I think there are two things. I, I, I think there is a lot more going on. Um, and there are some, you know, David Bloom, for example, out of Harvard is really led some fantastic research, which, which I think has got into the corporate world as well. And we do a huge amount of work now with all sorts of practitioners. You know, we work with architects and designers who are really, really becoming interested because there's going to be more older adults around. Um, and as I say, you know, I, I almost can't think of a group of corporates who have not at some stage asked me to go and give a talk. You know, I mean, I mean the power people are really interested, the retail people, non-stop interest, tourism, the banks, insurance, all the sort of obvious ones, as well as things like healthcare, education, transport. So I think people are beginning to become interested. And I think there's been a huge awareness due to COVID. And particularly, I don't know what it was like in Canada, but definitely in Europe, the way that older adults were discriminated against during the COVID pandemic um, was just extraordinary. And I think that has, you know, there's been so much written by professional bodies saying, hang on, you know, we, we really have to rethink the way that we treat a huge segment of our population. Um, well, I so I, I, I think, think there are I, people you know, talking about it and thinking about it. Yeah. This is the world I work in. I'm not seeing yeah. a lot of it. That's really and interesting. So, so advertising, I, I mean, advertising in media um, is... Go into an ad agency, Sarah. Go into an ad yeah. agency and oh, see to, if you can to, find anybody 
over under the thirty. Of yeah, I, I was just going to say to me that is 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 a real big no no. I mean, it's very difficult to get into that kind of a world. And of course, they often are the people who are presenting to the world. Um, I mean, it would it, it it would be very. I mean, there must be some kind of a survey that's been being. Well, I can done. tell you, I was on a call yesterday with. Uh, yeah. I don't know, 30 clients from, yeah, 30 clients yeah, from Ipsos. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, I'm a public opinion researcher. I'm not a demographer. I yeah. do yeah. provide people on advice on how to change hearts and minds. It's what I do. Yes. Uh, yeah. um, but, uh, and we were having, I was showing them population pyramids and yeah. saying, look, this is the, you know, talking about the concept of generations, which is like a very Western idea. Very different yeah. if you live in Nigeria. There's no baby boomers in Nigeria. <laughs> baby booms still happening. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so you, we have to rethink the way that we're talking about these things. But you know, and we start into okay. So what are we doing for older people? How are you showing them in your ads? And somebody would say, Well, I think we've got somebody who's working on a project over here where they're taking a look at yeah. it. And then we'd have a little bit of a conversation. Then somebody would come up. Mm -hmm. But you know, the real issue we have to deal with is how are we going to market to Gen Z? And it's like, yeah, it really, really is. But Gen Z, great. We got to figure out how to market to that. But you know what? From 1945 to today, that's all we've marketed to. If you haven't figured out Gen Z or the versions of Gen Z through the yes. ages, you've got more problems than I can deal with. It's yes. actually their parents and their grandparents who have all the money, and they're the fastest growing segment of the population. So, what are you doing for them? And the answer is just a blank stare. So, so how can we change that? Because this has been going on for 20 years. We're going to go on Lucy's podcast years. every couple of weeks, Sarah, <laughs> and you and I are going to sit back and be in violent agreement and be each other's biggest fans. Well, I'm not sure if you're my fan, but I'm certainly your fan. Um, and, 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 and keep talking about yeah. these things. Until we're well, I wanted to ask, like, it, sorry. We have to. Yeah, I mean, governments right. are not doing anything about it. And obviously, the numbers don't add up. I think social security spending in the US is like 20% or even over 20% of the budget. Uh, so what what are we going to see in terms of like government finances? Are countries going to default because they can't afford to pay social security? Are they going to borrow more, print more money? What's going to happen? Uh, there's a lot of interesting writing on this this, this topic these days. Um, because people are starting to, I shouldn't mm -hmm. say a lot. There's a selective amount of, of writing, some of it more academic. I tend to read the mainstream stuff more than the academic stuff. And uh, people are starting to think about it, but for some reason they think that this is all going to be relatively smooth and it's going to be a form of reallocation from one type of government responsibility to another type of government responsibility. An obvious one being defense. Uh, you know, there's a, a lot of talk these days, uh, not at the moment, but there was, about a geriatric peace. I mean, you know, older populations tend not to fight wars against each other. At least that's the theory. Um, and uh, we'll be able to redeploy some of the money that's being spent on defense to, you know, some dealing with some of these issues. But, you know, many, very many countries in the world, particularly in the Western world, are now ramping up their defense spending more than they were before. So I, I don't know how they're going to be able to deal with it. But I, I think it's an absolutely critical question. I don't think anybody's really talking about it seriously. I think that a lot of people think that this is a far off type of problem. It's a seven year problem. It's, it's going to really hit us in about seven years in a, in a very direct way. It's already hitting us today in some countries, a place like Italy, where the median age is 48, they're already struggling. Struggling, uh, struggling with this today. Uh, but um, we're going to have to have a lot more attention on it. And it's really ultimately going to be about the redeployment of resources. I mean, usually what we do when we're talking about uh, the aging of the population is there is there seems to be an obsession about talking about workforces. To me, that's almost the, the easiest part of this equation. <laughs> uh, you can, you know, robots, you can re retirement, maybe immigration. You, there's ways that you can kind of manipulate that. The part that's going to be really the hardest part of this is anything related to economic growth because older people don't spend money. Uh, they're in the conservation part of their lives rather than the, uh, than the actual uh, wealth creation part of their lives. So as a result of that, the economic challenges and the economic growth that we're going to need to be able to pay for that aging population is not going to be there. We're getting into a period in which low growth uh, and, and high levels of consumption of things like healthcare services are going to be things that a lot of governments are going to be facing and challenged with. And the only way that they've got to deal with it is to redeploy 
resources that they currently have because the tax base that they have among the older population, they're living on the wealth that they've accumulated over the last while, many of them managing that wealth to minimize their taxation. Uh, so it's, it's going to be a very complicated set of issues that, by mm -hmm. the way, dealing with the population, that the one thing that we know about them is they vote. Uh, they really, really vote. <laughs> so you have to be careful about mm -hmm. how you're going to deal with them. So it's going to be pretty complicated. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. But I think, I mean, I think one of the, I mean, I suppose one of the ways we look at it, and it will vary within different political systems, is yeah. that, no, to take Lucy's um, uh, question, countries won't fall, but actually the health and well-being of our older population, and in fact, probably our low-income population, will just get worse. I mean, you know, I mean, lack of being able to afford health and social security for a population is not going to bring down an entire country, but those people standing of living will just start to drop. Um, and then we may actually also see like healthy life expectancy and life expectancy go down, which, of course, is what we've seen in the States and to the certain extent in the UK. And a lot of that has been based on ideas around austerity, uh, um, particularly in the US, not looking after people in sort of late middle life. Um, so it, I, I think it is complicated. I mean, the one thing about voting, which is really interesting, is that a lot of, and it'd be interesting to see, because I haven't read a survey you've done, but I'm sure you have, but a lot of surveys have suggested that many older people don't actually vote on political lines. We know they tend to become more conservative than they're thinking, but we also know that they do change their attitudes. But governments believe they do. So governments will tend to target, you know, elder policies because they say, oh, we've got to keep the elderly people on board. And yet many older people, they belong to families and they're just as likely to vote for things that will benefit their children and grandchildren. But because I think there's been this perception that there is the grey vote, I think that really has influenced things over the last 20, 30 years. But I think it's been a perception rather than a reality. Yeah, what I would say on the grey vote is uh, I wouldn't look at it as an ideological vote. I would look at it as a reliable vote. So, okay, the thing, yes, so, yes, so yes. what they have that younger generations yeah. don't have is, is reliable voting behavior. But yes. what I do see in most political parties is that they may have like, let's do a, a thing for the seniors, but their whole focus, just like in marketing these days, yes. is what do we do with younger voters? And yes. it's like, there's not as many of them as you think, and no. they don't no. vote. <laughs> so, no. Because if they did, the UK never would have voted for Brexit. I'm just going to say Brexit. You know, yeah. I mean, I mean, one statistic people do not believe is that more people over 65 voted to remain than under 25. And that's yeah, what it was, the it was middle aged. It, it was it was more yeah, geographic and education that, yeah, that yeah. determined but, but, but uh, what those, happened. Yeah, but those people under 25 didn't vote. If they'd voted, we would still be in the EU. Yeah, but that's yeah, but this, is, this, this is the yeah. thing. But I can tell you, dealing in, in the world of politics and dealing with governments yes. and political parties, because that's what we do, um, uh, there, there is an obsession with young voters, old voters. Don't even think about yes. it. I, I, and I, I, you know what? I kind of say in presentations these days, I said, when's the next time that you're going to actually see a political platform targeted at older women? And, you know, you get a little tittering in the audience. Oh, mm -hmm. And it's like, well, let me explain older women. Uh, there's more of them than you think. They're wealthier than you think. They're more community connected than you think. They're the fastest growing part of the population. But you don't have anything for them. Same thing for consumers, because, uh, you know, you, you know this. I'm just going to I'm saying this for your sake, Lucy, not for Sarah's, because I'm <laughs> just being totally redundant. But um, uh, there's always more boys, boys born in every country than there are girls, except where there's an artificial intervention. So if you look at the sex ratio in every country where we just let nature take its course, it's usually like 104 to 105. By the age of 40, in every country where that's the case, uh, the discrepancy is gone. And the reason the discrepancy is gone is because of the 16 of the 20 reasons that you can die prematurely, they're more common among men. The four that are more common among women are just about exclusively related to women. So they're childbirth, uh, they, are, um, they are cervical cancer, and they are breast cancer. Also, men can get that. But also, the other, the other one that's more frequent than men is dementia. They're more likely to die of dementia because they're older. Uh, so they, they tend to outlive men. But this is an incredibly fast-growing group of the population. They tend to have a fair amount of wealth. Uh, they tend to be incredibly community-connected. Uh, if you want to find somebody who's happy in their life, find an older woman. Because <laughs> on surveys, they report very high levels of happiness. 
uh, especially actually interestingly enough, single women. The older mm -hmm. women who are single are doing pretty well. You want to find a group that's doing horribly badly, interview older single men. They're doing horribly in terms of everything. They're not community connected. They don't take care of their health. They're not optimistic about things. They're angry. A whole bunch of things. Their suicide rate is very high. Mm -hmm. So when I think about politics, uh, I, just to throw something in that's actually demographically derived, that's going to be an incredibly powerful part of our future. It's what older women think, because they're a huge group, they're community connected, they vote, and they, they have a positive outlook on what the, what the future should be. Uh, but when was the last time you saw anybody have a platform for older women? They just don't even talk about it. That's a great point. That's Very great interesting. Point. Just written it down. Yeah. <laughs> But go take a look. I'm in the UK. I'm sure you're going to find that that's absolutely the case. Yeah, yeah, no. I've just, fastest growing I mean, segment of the population. It's, it's older women. And yes. we think and, and we think that it's like old women outlive old men. No. Old women outlive men at every age. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. except child yeah. childbearing years, particularly in developing yeah. countries. That's a different situation. But in mm -hmm. a country in which that's not as much the issue, and by the way, declining fertility also makes that less of a likely killer of women, uh, younger women as well. But um, uh, in every country, this is, this, this, is, uh, this, is, this is the pattern. And they're an invisible, powerful group. So what kills men? Is it uh, like car accidents? Every stupid, every stupid thing you can do, a man does. They're more likely to have ris risky jobs. They're more likely to, uh, three times more likely to commit suicide. Uh, they are uh, particularly older men. Um, and uh, living in rural areas who are single are a really difficult group. Uh, uh, everything related to uh, 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 things like smoking, taking drugs, consuming alcohol to excess, all of those things dominated by men. Um, diseases like heart disease, cancer, and all the rest of it, things that if you actually visited your doctor and listened to your doctor's advice and lived healthily and did all those things that you could do, you could reduce it. Men don't do it. They don't even do things like finish their prescriptions when doctors give them to them. Uh, so uh, everything that you can do to kill yourself early, 16 of those, 16 of those 20 reasons, men are there. Men do. And, uh, and uh, that's, that's, that's why we're seeing this discrepancy continues. Although men are starting to catch up a bit, it still persists. <laughs> But, but, but there are also biological reasons. And um, so, in, I mean, there is uh, genetically, um, you know, women are XX, men are XY, and most of the information is on the X chromosome. Uh, and therefore, women have this second chromosome, which is like a backup. So if something goes wrong with the first X, they've got a second, men haven't. Uh, and if you look at um, species uh, which are double, but the other way around. So the letters are differently, but let's just say um, birds are YY and YX. Uh, birds tend to live longer. Male birds tend to live longer than female birds because they don't have that double. Um, we know hormones. Um, we know that estrogen protects, um, testosterone doesn't protect. And in fact, there is some evidence that it actually increases morbidity or illness, disease and mortality. And then the immune system, and that's what COVID showed us. I mean, we knew that from other chronic diseases, but uh, there used to be some idea that women's immune system was much better at viruses and men's was better at bacteria. Um, but in actual fact, uh, we now know that actually women's immune systems are just stronger at fighting both viruses and bacteria. And that's why far more men, and at a much younger age, uh, died from, from COVID. So you know, the mortality rate in older men was much higher. Uh, and women uh, were uh, men were about five years younger than women when they sort of uh, you know were particularly hit by um, COVID. So, I mean, I, it, it's very interesting as to whether we will ever you know um, see the sort of sexes coming together, and probably not because just the way we're made tends to mean that women are sort yeah, of see, and predetermined and to live longer. Yeah, and mm -hmm. this is this is the kind of discussion that more people need to have. They need to understand these yeah. things. I'm a person who's like, I've heard some of what Sarah has, has said mm -hmm. before, but I haven't put it, heard it put as well as she just put it. Um, and mm -hmm. this is a whole, this is a whole topic, by the way, that you can't even really have a conversation about these days. Cause what is gender <laughs> these days? I know. It's, it's a very complicated conversation. Please. Please. My, 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 my plea on this one is that if the ones that are actually in your control, <laughs> men took yeah. control over, 
they yeah. would li- they would live longer. They would live a, a more a more uh, uh, I'd say a fuller yeah. life. They won't live as long as women do. And as I and I usually make a joke about this to, in, in in presentations. I say, guys, if if you can hang on to a hundred, you'll be the most popular guy at the nursing home because there's five of them to one of you. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and yeah. and and but people don't know those things, right? They don't know about the ratios. They don't know mm-hmm. about the situation uh, and difference in men and women. And when I and when I looked at it in more detail, the thing that I found the most interesting was that um, that it, it's it's pretty much at every age except that first couple of years of age that women actually live longer than, than men do or do better than, than, than men do. Yeah. But we're telling you this, Lucy, probably for the first time. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, it's, it's not a, something that's well known, which is, brings me back to the question of older women. I mean, they're a very important growing, fast growing part of the population. Are, they're invisible. They're invisible in advertising. They're invisible. Nobody makes yeah. anything for them. So in terms of like industries uh, and business and job market, where do you see that going? Which industries will be positively affected by this demographic shift? Which ones will be negatively affected? Like obviously elderly care, care homes, we will need more of those because the old people 20 years from now will be the childless people. Uh, No one will take care of them. So where do you see that going? Anything that happens to deal with uh, youth, you really need to think about again. Um, and anything that has to deal with older people, you really need to think about again. And, uh, you know, everything from how you manufacture cars to how you plan cities to how you even think about transportation needs to take this kind of thing into account. I mean, there's a lot of talk these days about the 15 minute city and yeah. uh, great, a great idea for people who live downtown. <laughs> What is the 15 minute uh, city? If, Oh, the idea that you should be able to get everything you need in your life in 15 minutes. And the way that most cities uh, deal with that these days, yeah, the way that most cities deal with that these days is they build bike lanes, for example. And it's like, how many 80-year-old people are there on bikes? Maybe we need to think about yeah. these this yeah, as absolutely. a mobility space. Or, uh, By the way, it's a great thing that you're building all these bike lanes that don't allow parking in front of walk-in clinics that people need to get into. Maybe we need to think about that. Because they mm-hmm. have this idea mm-hmm. that it's like... Uh, Uh, you know, 30-year-old uh, people who want to live downtown in flats and ride on bikes everywhere, uh, that that's the 15-minute city. Well, that's not the reality of what our future population is going to be. Mm-hmm. Yes, there are going to be people who are in that situation, but there are going to be an awful lot of people who are not going to be in that situation. And we need to think about allocating that infrastructure in different ways. Uh, but um, that again, a conversation that's not really happening. Mm-hmm. If you had a demographic discussion about what how cities should be planned, we'd be talking about it in very different ways than we're talking about it now. I, uh, I remind clients all the time, you know, what's the most frequently growing household in most Western countries? People living by themselves. Mm-hmm. That's in, in Canada today. The most common household is a person living by themselves. And they tend to be disproportionately women. They tend to be in the younger part of their lives before they uh, decide to form a family. And they tend to be in the latter part of their lives. Older women, when they uh, divorce or widowed or whatever, much less likely than older men to get remarried. And they tend to stay more on their own. Not all of them, but it tends to be a, a real fairly dramatic difference between the two groups. So what are we doing for them? How are we mm-hmm. thinking about this kind of thing? And it's like, Blank stairs. <laughs> Blank stairs. I, I mean, I think Daryl's absolutely spot on. Um, I, I just was going to pick up on two things. So, Lucy, you said something very interesting, and and that's about you know childlessness. Um, and of course, you know, m- nearly all countries. I mean, if you look at the global south, that you know, obviously, children are doing care for older adults. But in fact, all across high income and middle income countries, it is often children who are caring for older people. If you are childless. What is going to happen to you? And I think that is a really big question we need to tackle. And the other thing is to go back to this thing of employment, because the real exciting thing, we, we have made such advances in understanding of the brain and particularly around, you know, brain scans. We now scan healthy brains. We never used to do that. We have libraries of brain scans. We, we can use brain scans in the same way that we will use, you know, quantitative survey data. And the really interesting thing that is coming out um, and some governments are interested in this is the way that our intelligence changes across the life course. 
Uh, and so we know that when we're younger, we've got something called fluid intelligence. And fluid intelligence means that we are very, very good at very, very quick decisions. And the example I give in a talk is, you know, try playing snap with a seven year old. They will beat you um, because they're so quick and they get it instantly. Um, and that starts to decline from our early 20s onwards. And then we have this crystallized intelligence, which we grow across our lives and it peaks somewhere between 40 and 70. Uh, and that's things like lateral thinking. Um, so, for example, uh, if, if, if you say to a 15 year old, uh, you give them a complicated sentence, you take a word out and you say, put another word in. Many 15 year olds can't. Everybody in their 50s can think of another word. That's the sort of lateral thinking uh, idea. Um, and, and I was uh, you know, at a meeting in Canberra with the Australian government and the Treasury Department is really interested in this idea because they want to think if we've got an aging population and a knowledge economy, this is the group we need. We need the 40 to 70 year olds driving our economies because in actual fact, robots can do a lot of what the 30 year olds can do when you're making you know, these fast snap decisions. So I think if we take the other trends in and we have talked a little bit about climate and environment, and then we take technological change in. And again, you know, Daryl brought up a little bit about that. The 21st century is going to have these big, strong themes running across it. Demography is only one of them. They're actually all going to come together. So we need to rethink our whole workforce. So in other words, I'm sure we will. Or one idea is that we will work exactly the same number of hours, but we will spread it differently across 50, 60 years rather than concentrating it into 25 to 30 years. Um, that we probably will be in and out of employment. At the moment, you go to school, then you tend to work, then you tend to retire. But we'll be mixing sabbaticals and opportunities for leisure and caring and education across our life courses. So it'll be fluid life courses where we will be constantly trying to get a different skill set. And that will be because of lifelong education, which everyone will have to buy into. And then we'll use that, those skill sets, we'll increase them, we'll change them, and we'll be able to contribute to whatever the economy throws up in the next 30, 40 years. But older adults should and will definitely play an important part in that. Mm -hmm. You know, I just uh, brings to mind a Bob Dylan quote, I was so much older then, I'm younger than that now. Yes. <laughs> and and, and, and uh, uh, yeah, I think that I think to a certain extent, it's true. Right? But uh, uh, yeah, Sarah's talking about exactly the issues that we were going to need to be considering. And uh, that's why I think, uh, you know, giving voice to these, uh, to these ideas is something that we're going to have to do a lot more of. I'm sure she's talking blue in the face to audiences. <laughs> I'm doing the same kind of thing. And, and it's, it still surprises me how shocked people are by yeah. even raising uh, these issues. But uh, mm -hmm. I, I would hope during that whole course of a lifetime, people would also find time to have kids and raise a family if they decide yeah. they want to do fun. that. <laughs> yeah, well, as, as, as I remind people who get very emphatic, usually when I'm out doing presentations about their positions on climate, and that's fine, you, you can have that position uh, that, you know, they're not having kids. Well, somebody's got to have them. <laughs> we're, we're not going to exist in 100 years. So, and that's if we live to our max. Okay. Um, so uh, at some point, we're get, all of this stuff is going to come together. But the, the truth is what it is, is I think going to be the defining issue of the century. I know people talk about climate, obviously going to be a very big part of this, this conversation, but this is the one that's rising and people are not uh, paying as much attention to it as, as they are or as they should be. And it's the one that's going to have the most direct effect on the most people. Yeah, I think Fantastic. we've become too comfortable here in the West. Um, it's not the poor kids, the poor people that are not having kids. It's the rich people in the West that are not having. No, kids. the rich people, the rich people are having kids. It's the middle class that isn't. The middle class. So yeah, it's funny. What happens is poor people, for all the reasons that Sarah gave before, yeah. Yeah. tend to have uh, more than uh, more than replacement in many instances, uh, <laughs> and then. Rich people, once you get over to a situation where cost is no issue and leisure is no issue and nothing else is an issue, uh, I was with a group this weekend. They were telling in their own family circumstances what mm -hmm. their situation was because they're a family trust. They got billions and that kind of thing. And they, they have lots of kids. Their birth rate, they yes. calculated for the family was 2.6. It's people who are in the middle class. So Sarah's colleagues at Oxford who are mm -hmm. on faculty with her in, in her department are the ones that aren't having kids. Yes. So, so, so demographically, we, we call this the J curve. That it goes, you know, goes down, but but you actually it comes up again because you can afford the people mover. Your wife doesn't work. You can have your four children. You've got a yeah. big house, but it, it's a very small percentage of the population. But we do see that effect. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have three. And, and we're, we're not we're not talking we're not talking like ninety thousand dollars a year. These are people yeah. who are wealthy. Yeah. 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 Daryl, do you have children? One. Okay, I've got three. Yeah. Well. Daryl, well, there you go. <laughs> you <did. laughs> it wasn't for I should say. It, it, well, I was. I was. I should say it wasn't for lack of trying. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. I was, I was I was scrolling through Twitter last night and there was a this tweet from a successful, I would say upper middle class 30 plus year old woman and she said the scariest part of hypothetically having kids one day is the lack of sleep. And that really made me laugh because that shows how comfortable we are and that we think of children as a burden, right? And and lack of sleep is like our biggest worry, really? That's yeah, well, that's kind of ridiculous. Well, one of the things John Ebbotson, who I wrote the book with, uh, and, and I talked mm-hmm. about is somebody has to do something one of these days on what are the levers for making children popular again? Like mm-hmm. rather than seeing them as kind of an icky burden, what is the what are the levers that you can use to make people feel like you we used to feel about kids and families and leaving out religion and you know responsibility but it it was seen as a joyful thing to have a bunch of kids around the christmas tree Mm -hmm. going on a family vacation and you know we we have such positive memories i'm sure sarah you do too of of what it was like as you're you're, you're raising your children and you wouldn't have traded that for anything it was it was an amazing life experience and and we have so many people who think of that as in such a negative light so there's got to be, there's a psychological cultural aspect to this that at some point somebody has to address. I don't know if it'll ever be me, but somebody, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a great topic for somebody to write about. Because yes. I do think yep. culture is a really big part of this. We want it to be really rational. We want it to be like, I've got, uh, sh- you know, Shona, I can't remember her last name. Oh, Shona Swan, who wrote the book on countdown on, on f- uh, sperm rates and fertility and all that. Mm. She likes to see it as a biological problem. Okay. Mm. Well, there's part of it. That's probably that. And then there's uh, the people that you usually deal with in government. They see it as a financial problem. So they, it's all about programming because that's what they understand. And then this cultural part, it's like, well, that's nobody's responsibility. So who's going to deal with that? Who's going to talk mm-hmm. about that? Because it's a really interesting question. Because when you go out and you look at the survey data, right at the top of the list. Yeah. Well, I, it was- I, I, I mean, so so Daryl has just summed it up. It's incredibly complex. There's no easy uh, and it's not black and white. But it seems like we agree on everything. Was there anything we disagreed on? Oh, I think the trends we agree on, uh, maybe the rate at which it's going to happen or how it's going to happen, we might have a, uh, but I, I'm sure Sarah and I could sit down over uh, an adult beverage in a pub in, in Oxford and, and find that we agree on probably about 99 or yes. 98% yes. of everything that each of us is saying. So That's good. That's good. Well, it, it was Let's a great it. discussion. It was a great discussion. I learned so much and I hope a bunch of people are going to see this and uh, we'll have more kids. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Lucy. Thank you.